that, uh, that, that, that whole message is good. But the key to that message is it's finished. The change in you is finished in heaven. And so as we begin to talk today, uh, it's the same message. Jesus paid the price for you to be changed from glory to glory. So it's finished. That's why the title of the message is not, the battle is raging and I hope you get victory. (laughs) The title of the message is, the battle is over and the victory is ours, each one of us, because it is finished. What's the last thing that Jesus said before his death? It is finished. Amen? And so we have to change our mindset. We have, to, we have to change the way we think about everything in this life. Otherwise, we're going to go backwards and we're going to live in misery. And then we'll be singing, Oh, misery in Jesus. I hope he's my savior. For... No, 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 no. It's victory in Jesus. You remember that song? I don't know if you ever sang that here, but victory in Jesus, my savior forever. It was uh, number 242 in the Nazarene hymnal when I was growing up. And then we got new hymnals and it changed to 434. Um, And so, see, even our hymnals have to change sometimes. But anyway, um, there is a verse in the Bible, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, that says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It doesn't say lack of victory. It doesn't say a lack of mercy or a lack of grace. It says for a lack of knowledge. What is it that we don't know? Whatever it is you don't know, that's the thing that's holding you back. Do you understand that? Your lack of knowledge is what holds you back from having a spirit of knowledge upon you. It's not enough to recognize that there's a war. Because all we ever did was recognize that there was a war, but we never went to war. Nothing would change. It's not enough to recognize that there's war. We must know the truth and declare our freedom to experience the victory in spiritual warfare. So what I'm telling you is, it is finished. The battle is over. The victory is yours. But unless you recognize that, you're going to be fighting the rest of your life. You're going to be fighting from the trenches instead of living in victory seated in the heavenlies. Because in the spiritual realm, God always sees us as we will be. That's why Ephesians uh, 2 it's six or eight or somewhere. Uh, in Ephesians chapter two, the Bible says, together he seated us, seated us in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. And in Revelation, uh, I, I, I spoke the verse last week that to those who are victors, they will sit upon Christ's throne. Why? Because in the spiritual realm, we're already there. That's how God sees us as as we will be. So when God says, when Jesus says it is finished, he's he's not speaking figuratively. He's speaking literally. It is finished. In heaven, it's finished. The battle is over in heaven. And you, all of you, if you've given your heart and your life to Christ, the victory is yours. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we live in the body, we do not wage war in an unspiritual way, since the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that is raised up 
against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. It doesn't say go to confession once a week and take your thoughts captive once a week. It says, it, it says, let me read it because I just forgot the wording, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. Spiritual warfare is a 24-hour, 365-day-a-year job for us. There are two realms that we're dealing with. There are three realms, but there are two realms that we're dealing with. The physical realm, that's our body, and the spiritual realm, which is that realm where angels and demons exist. There is a third realm, which is what we call the heavenly realm or God's abode. And that's where only truth and God exist. There is no deception. There's no sin. There's no sickness or disease in that realm. And when God's word comes from that realm, the Bible, Jesus, the word comes from that realm. But the problem we have today is it has to come through that spiritual realm where angels and demons exist. And so when truth comes through that second realm, what's the first thing that the devil wants to do? He wants to put a mixture in there. He wants to take an orb of truth, but then he wants to deceive us by putting a little mixture in there. And so he says, so God says, you are saved by grace. And so the devil says, well, grace means that your sin doesn't matter to God. So you can live your lives however you want because um, God knows your heart. And even though you're, you're constantly sinning and you're doing all of these things against the nature and the character of God, it's okay. His grace will cover you. That's not what the Bible says. That's an unholy mixture of deception that we call today greasy grace. God says, be holy for I am holy. He's called us out of the world. He's called us out of the darkness and into the light. And so you see, when things come through that second realm, when things come through that angelic, demonic realm, there's a chance that deception is going to be attached to it. And so if we in the physical realm don't know the word and don't understand God's character and nature, we're going to fall for that deception every single time. Like the deception that says, well, the devil's going to win the war here on earth, and then someday Jesus is going to come back and take us all to heaven. That is deceptive thinking right there. The devil is not going to win this war on earth. You know who's going to win the war on earth? The church is going to win the war here on earth. Because I don't know if you know this, but we don't go to heaven after we die. Heaven comes to us. This earth will once again be the Garden of Eden. And so it's the church's responsibility to be the church and to take back the culture why this building exists in Davenport, Iowa. It is your responsibility to change the culture in Davenport and Moline and Rock Island and Bettendorf and East Moline and all the other surrounding communities. Do you know that with all of the, with the Quad Cities and then all the surrounding communities in this region, there's about 450,000 people. And there's 30 or 35 of us here today guess what? We win. This is Gideon's army. He had to take 300 people against 30,000 troops. Guess who won? God's people won. Right? Abraham, when he was, uh, when he was fighting uh, against the, the king of, um, uh, I think it was Sodom, uh, had about 300 men and he was fighting again roughly they're thinking somewhere between 25 and 30,000 people and Abraham's men won that battle why because God's people win so the, the point of this is that is that we don't wage war in a physical way so we don't go out into the community 
and begin to slay sinners with our swords. Okay? And if we're not supposed to go out and kill sinners with our swords, we certainly should not be killing each other in the church with our swords. But sadly, that's what we're doing. We're fighting each other, aren't we? Instead of going out and fighting the demonic spirits in this realm, taking back the region. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the world powers of darkness and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. We aren't fighting one another. Husband and wife, you are not fighting one another. If you're fighting, you're fighting demonic forces. You're not fighting one another. Parents and children, you are not fighting each other. If you're fighting, parents and children, you're fighting demonic forces that are trying to separate and divide you. Neighbors, if, if he blows grass on your side and you don't like it, you're not fighting your neighbor. You're fighting demonic forces. I had an aunt and uncle that bought a house in Clinton and uh, my uncle kept his yard pretty meticulous. And so what he would do is he would, he would run his mower uh, around the property line one time and then he would uh, mow the rest of the grass. Well, the, when, he, when he mowed around the property line, he was blowing grass onto the neighbor's side. I mean, it wasn't really, really long. And the neighbor came out and he says, well, I guess we're not ever going to get along. And my uncle, I mean, this is the first week and my uncle said, what? He goes, if you're going to blow grass in my yard every time you mow, we're not ever going to get along. <laughs> so my uncle had to change the whole way he mowed his yard because he was fighting this demonic force and uh, he was a believer. So he, he changed his ways simply because he wanted to be able to be a witness to his neighbor. But it's just ridiculous, isn't it? We're not fighting each other in the church. I, here's what I find interesting is most of the fights in churches are usually about the color of the carpet or about the decorations and stuff. And so I have figured out a really easy way uh, to stop all that fighting. If you don't like the color of the carpet, pay for it to be replaced. And nobody will argue with you. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We fight about the silliest things in church. And you know what the, the interesting thing is? Is we're not fighting one another. We're fighting demonic forces, even in the church. Right? The battle is in the spiritual realm. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word is the only weapon you need to slay your dragons and your demons. Because God's word is the truth. God's word is the only weapon you need. You don't need persuasive arguments. You don't need a uh, court of law to give you a decision to win your battles. You don't need a 22 pistol tucked in your belt to win your battles. It might be a safe thing to do during the unrest, but I'm just telling you, God's word is much more effective than a 22 pistol tucked in your belt. And listen, I'm not against guns. I, I, you know, guns don't kill people. Stupid people kill people. <laughs> and, uh, but my point is, is that God's word, I remember, um, I remember the story um, of a couple that were walking in a neighborhood and they walked it a lot. And there was a dog uh, that was in one of the yards that used to just bark at them at the fence. And one day they're walking down. And I think it was either a Rottweiler or a Doberman. I can't remember which. And I remember uh, the story says that 
um, they were walking down the street and the front gate was open and they were like, oh my. And pretty soon they were confronted with, it was either the Rottweiler or this Doberman barking and, and at them, kind of aggressively coming at them. And the woman said, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And the dog turned around and ran away back into his yard. And you, you can laugh at that. You can say, well, it's a cute little story. No, that's the power of God's word. Is that, guess what? They didn't need, um, they didn't need a gun. They didn't need a taser. They didn't need you know, any of the latest technology. All they needed was the name of Jesus. And the demonic realm has to flee. Because his name is above all other names. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. See, God sent the Holy Spirit to teach us how to live free from strongholds and from temptations in this life. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. In other words, the Holy Spirit was given to us so that we could bring heaven to earth through his word by declaring and decreeing his word. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes we get sometimes we get in this habit of saying Holy Spirit change this situation. And the deception of that is that he's in you so you will change this situation. Because in Genesis when God originally made man in 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 27 127 He gave us dominion to steward the earth in his place. He gave us dominion over the the fish and the birds and the animals and all living creatures. That means he even gave us, he even gave us dominion over human beings that are being uh, inspired by a demonic spirit. That we, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Today, in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, we can declare truth and demonic forces have to flee. In uh, Mark chapter 5, the first 20 verses is a story where Jesus came across the Sea of Galilee and he comes into a region and there is a man by the tombs that is possessed by many demons. And he was so strong that um, even when they chained him with chains, he could break the chains apart. The demons were so, so uh, strong in him that, that nothing could, um, nothing could um, hold him down. And so when people came to that region, they would go miles out of their way to go a different way, simply because... This guy with this legion of demons controlled a land area. So you know what our high apostle Jesus Christ did? He went into that area and he shifted the atmosphere and he changed the culture. And he approached that man and the man said, what do you have to do with me? Jesus said, what's your name? And the demon said, legion. And so after a few brief words, Jesus said, get out of here. And you know what they did? They fled. You know why? Because it is finished. And that man was freed from his demons that day. Why? Because the power of God's word. See, when, when I say the power of God's word, I'm not just talking about the ink and the pages. I'm talking about Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. 
He comes into your life. Why? To change atmospheres, and to shift atmospheres and to change the culture. Why? Because if your culture hasn't been changed, you can't change culture out here in society. Right? Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth, and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, God's word, is the final authority in your life and gives you freedom from all that enslaves you and keeps you in bondage. If you are in bondage to anything today, it's simply because you're not living in the victory God has given you to live in. I know a guy that went to the dentist this last week. He's a smoker. Had to have a tooth pulled, and there was infection in it. So they pulled the tooth and said, all right, now go home, and you can't suck on a straw, and you can't smoke for four days. And the guy said, uh, well, I guess if there's a time to quit smoking, this would be the time to quit smoking. If I can go four days, I probably can uh, kick the habit. And by the second day, he was token on a cigarette. And uh, you know what? It, it was, it, there was so much bondage in this guy. And you know, the, the interesting thing, I know this person, and uh, the, the interesting thing is the reason that this person smokes is not because it's cool, not because of anything other than <clears throat> he has given in to the anxieties in his life and he thinks that the cigarettes take his anxiety away. And my, my next thought is, really, so how come every half hour you have to have a cigarette? It doesn't take your anxiety away. It fools you for about 25 minutes, and then boom, you're right back out smoking the cigarette again. This, uh, this is not a lesson or a, a, about smoking. What I'm saying is if you're in bondage to anything, it's because you are not living in victory. Same can be said for alcohol. The same can be said... For drugs, the same can be said for anything that enslaves you. Your passiveness in a situation where you're supposed to be the leader, you're now enslaved to that situation. But you don't have to be. Colossians 2, 14 through 15 says, He, Jesus, erased the certificate of death with its obligations that was against us and has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Now listen to this. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities, and he disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them. See this symbol right here? This isn't just the symbol of forgiveness of sins. This is a symbol that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities in your life. And he publicly disgraced them. In other words, he called them out and embarrassed them by telling everyone in the world through his death, burial, and resurrection that they have no power over the, the person who is seated in the heavenlies with Christ. That's anyone who is a believer. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. Disarmed means their weapons are water pistols compared to your bazooka. You get it? I'm not joking. I'm, I'm serious. The Bible says that the devil's a liar and that he's the father of all lies. And it says that he, everything he says is a lie. It says he can't do anything but lie. And the beautiful thing about that is, is you're not a son of the devil. You're a son of the father. And it says the father doesn't tell the truth. It says the father is truth. So the reason the devil is disarmed 
and the rulers and authorities, the demons, are disarmed is because we know the truth. I don't mean we know the truth. I mean we know the truth. And we are known by the truth. And because we know him and we are known by him, no lie can overtake you and no lie can destroy you. In Jesus' name. Ephesians 1, 20 through 21. I got a little ahead of myself. That cross represents the fact that Jesus demonstrated, or God demonstrated this power in Messiah by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens. Do you know why he's at the right hand of the Father? Because the right hand symbolizes power. I just want to make sure you understood that. The right hand always symbolizes power. Now, if you're left hand, handed, okay, I'm sure in your life the left hand symbolizes power, but this is God, and evidently God's right-handed. I don't know. But the right hand always means power, okay? That's just a little joke, okay? Scripture doesn't uh, contradict itself. The right hand means power, and so if Jesus is sitting at the right hand, it means Jesus is the power of God to disarm and destroy all these rulers and authorities that are bugging you. says, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but in the one to come. That means Jesus won the victory forever. Not only in this age, but in the eternal age, it's won there too. Because at that point, the devil will not be able to mess with God's people. So the resurrection sealed the deal and gave those of us in Christ the ability to rule and reign with him from that throne, from the right hand of God, from the power of God. Ephesians 2, 6, again, together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavenlies. We are seated. It's like we're sitting on Jesus' lap. And he must have a big lap because there's a lot of us. Finally, Wait, I'll, I'll, do the, I'll do the preacher thing. In conclusion, <laughs> yeah, I got 20 minutes left. So James 4, 7, the Bible says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll be a little less powerful. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, that's not what it says. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He, not he may flee, not he might flee, not in a thousand years he's going to flee, he will flee from you. We have the ability and the right to resist the devil simply by submitting to God and his word. That's the simple message of the gospel. The devil loses, Jesus wins, you're in Jesus, so you win. All right, real quickly. There are four battles that I see, four major battles. There there could be more battles, but these are the four major ones. Sinful habits, addictions, and bondage. You know what that is? That's carnality. That's us living in our fleshly life. If you're trying, if if you are living a fleshly life, you're going to struggle your entire life because the devil knows he's got you where he wants you. Carnality. When you hear the term, oh, they're just a carnal Christian, we don't don't hear that too much today. That was big back in the 60s and 70s when I was growing up. Dad, how come that guy is so wicked and mean? Well, he's a carnal Christian, son. (laughs) So I studied the word and found out you can't be carnal and a Christian at the same time. So you're either carnal or you're a Christian. Number two, emotional instability, psychological bondage. That simply means we're soulish that we spend more time in our emotions than we do in the truth of God's word. Read the Psalms. Most of the Psalms are David saying, woe is me, life is bad. The enemy's at the door and he wants to kill me. But right in the middle of that, he goes, but God. And then the Psalm turns from woe is me to praise the God and father of our, well, praise God. 
and, and praise him because he protects me, because he guides me, because he leads me, because he helps me win every battle. That soulish life is that selfish, excuse me, I hope this doesn't offend you, narcissistic lifestyle. Do you know that every believer was a narcissist until they came to Christ? And what Christianity does, it gets you out of yourself and gets you living for him. So don't be offended if I call you narcissistic. We all were narcissistic at one point. And some of us maybe are still struggling a little bit with it. But the, the goal of Christianity is to get us out of ourself. Stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about him and start thinking about others. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. It means if you wouldn't inflict the damage you want to do to your neighbor on yourself, don't inflict it upon him. <laughs> That's spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare says, I want to lie. I want to tell a lie. The officer stopped me, says, do you know how fast you're going? I want to say, nope. Didn't even look at the speedometer. When I know I was going 75 and a 55, not me personally, I never do that. Oops, <laughs> I just lied. Um, spiritual warfare is telling the truth instead of telling a lie. Yes, officer, I do know how fast I was going. I'm in a hurry to get home because my wife's got supper on and I left a half hour later than I was supposed to. And I'm more scared of her than I am of you, so write me the ticket and I'll go home. <laughs> <laughs> I did get stopped once for doing 45 and a 55. Uh, we were living in Morrison at the time. My daughter worked at the Dairy Queen and she wasn't driving yet. So it was just before nine, I'm going to pick her up so she can, uh, so to bring her home. And uh, I'm doing 45 on Highway 30. And um, all of a sudden I see red lights behind me and I'm like, and I knew I was going 45. So he stops me and he walks up and he said, sir, do you know how fast you're going? And I said, yeah, I was going about 45. He goes, yes, you were. Do you know what the speed limit is? I said, well, it's 55 here. He goes, then why were you doing 45? I said, because in about a quarter of a mile, it turns to 45 where uh, 78 comes and meets 30. And I said, I just got on the hillside road, so that's only a couple miles. So I just did 45 so I wouldn't breeze through that at 55 and get a ticket. And he said, oh. Well, just a minute. So he goes back and he runs my plates and he comes back up and he says, do you know why I stopped you? And I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, because this was back when uh, Clinton didn't have a casino. It was a gambling boat on the river. Uh, so it was right there next to 30. He said, because people go to the gambling boat and he said, they get tanked up and then they think if they drive 45 on, on uh, 30 that I'm not going to stop them because they're going under the speed limit. And he said, most of the time I, I catch people drunk driving because they're going slower. And uh, I said, oh, okay. So we finished everything up. And then I said, hey, officer, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry. Um, I'll try to drive a little faster next time. He did not appreciate that joke. <laughs> but the issue was, I, 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 you know, the issue was I knew I, I hadn't done anything wrong. So I was defending myself for not having done anything wrong. <laughs> and so there was a confidence in me and a boldness in me to be able to talk to this officer and not be afraid of him. Why? Because I was trying to obey the law so much so that I was doing 10 miles under the limit. So when we are in a situation where we are in spiritual warfare, telling the truth instead of telling a lie, um, loving someone instead of hating them, that's spiritual warfare. And we don't, we don't see it that way sometimes. Number three, distraction or inability to focus. That's just simply a lack of devotion sometimes. And it's what leads to lukewarm living. And number four, apathy. You know what the problem with apathy is? Where you just don't really care about anything? Is apathy is the number one thing that leads us to deceptive doctrine. I don't care enough about the truth to do anything about it. So pretty soon we begin to believe everything that's out there. 
people come up and say, what do you believe? Well, I believe this. Well, my truth is, did you create the world? No, then you don't have a truth. (laughs) Only God has truth because he is truth. 1 John 4, verse 4. In, seriously, in closing, this is the last verse I'm going to read. The Apostle John writes, You are of God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen. Need I say more? <laughs> Doesn't that settle it? God's word settles it. Or God's word says it. I believe it. That settles it. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Why would we let someone who is damned to eternal hell take us off our mark and get us to do something that could eventually make us end up living with him instead of in the glory of God? Amen? Amen. Just pray with me, Father. As we just begin to process all of this information, all of these scriptures, all of this truth, Father, help us not to just walk out thinking, hmm, good sermon. Help us to let it be life-changing. As Cheryl gave the word about, God wants change in us. He's willing to do all of that work of sending his son to die on a cross and being resurrected so that we could be changed from glory to glory into his his image. And so, Lord, we know that while we're on earth, that process is an active process. We're constantly being changed. We're constantly cutting off those fleshly things. We're constantly taking every thought captive so that one day we'll be in the glory, living uh, that redeemed lifestyle without any influence of the enemy, forever and ever and ever. And it's not just about what we get, but it's about bringing honor and glory to you, Father, who did all this work simply because you love us and want relationship with us. So help us to change our mindsets and our behaviors to be in line with your word, your will, and your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ah. I don't want to.